What is your dream? Warning, this video is made as an educational material and contains sexual health content. In this video, we are going to discuss about the anatomy of the female reproductive system. The female reproductive system is a more complex system than the male reproductive system, because in addition to gamete formation, it also has the task of nourishing and maintaining the fetus. The female reproductive system includes the external reproductive organ visible in a woman's pelvis, the vulva, and the internal reproductive organs, vagina, cervix, uterus, a pair of ovaries, and a pair of oviducts. These organs, along with the mammary glands located within the female breast, support the events such as ovulation, fertilization, pregnancy, childbirth, and childcare, both structurally and functionally. Let us now discuss the anatomy of the female reproductive system in detail. The external reproductive organ visible in the pelvic region of a woman is called the vulva. The fatty tissue located above the vulva is referred to as the mons pubis. The vulva is comprised of various parts. The innermost region of the vulva is known as the vestibule. At the upper part of this vestibule is an opening called the urethral orifice, through which urine exits from the urinary bladder. The lower opening of this region is the vaginal opening, which is the external entrance to the vagina. The vagina is a large fibromuscular tube. It extends from the external vaginal opening to the cervix internally. This structure constitutes the female copulatory organ, facilitating the entry of sperm during intercourse and the discharge of menstrual blood during menstruation. A portion or the entire external opening of the vaginal canal is covered by a thin, ring-shaped tissue known as the hymen. In most cases, the hymen tears during the first coitus, first sexual intercourse. However, in some women, it may remain intact. Physical activities such as falling, jumping, cycling, or horseback riding can also impact the hymen membrane. Therefore, the hymen cannot be considered a definitive indicator of a woman's virginity. Above the vestibular region is the clitoris, a highly sensitive part of the female anatomy due to the high concentration of nerve endings. The clitoris is comparable in structure to the glands penis in males. External to this vestibular region, in the first layer, two hairless folds of skin are located from left to right and from right to left. This region is called the labia minora. Above this, in the second layer, the labia majora are located from left to right and from right to left. These are made of thicker skin than the labia minora. This region, located outside all the external reproductive organs, protects the other genital organs located below it. Its upper part is covered with hair. In the vestibular region, slightly behind the vaginal opening on both the left and right sides, are the Bartolin's glands, also known as the greater vestibular glands. During sexual arousal, these glands secrete a slippery mucus as a lubricating substance into the vaginal opening. This lubrication facilitates the smooth entry of the penis during intercourse. These glands are analogous to the bulbourethral glands in males. Another set of glands, known as Skene's glands or parorethral glands, are located on the anterior wall of the vaginal canal and around the urethral opening on both the right and left sides. These glands also secrete a lubricating fluid. This secretion is believed to contribute to antimicrobial properties that protect against urinary tract infections. In function, these glands are considered analogous to the prostate gland in male. The vagina opens internally into the uterus through the cervix. The uterus is an inverted pear-shaped organ located in the pelvic cavity, situated between the urinary bladder and the rectum. The uterus is a hollow, muscular, thick-walled, and highly vascularized organ. It has the remarkable ability to expand to accommodate the growing fetus during pregnancy. If the ovum is fertilized, the fertilized egg implants itself in the uterus and develops into a fetus. From the time of implantation to part 
parturition, the uterus provides a nurturing environment. The developing fetus receives all its necessary nutrients through the uterus. The upper spherical portion of the uterus is called the fundus, while the larger portion beneath it is referred to as the body of the uterus. Below the body, the uterus narrows and connects to the vagina through a short passage known as the cervix. The hollow space within the cervix is called the cervical canal. This canal opens into the vagina via the external orifice and into the uterus via the internal orifice. Together, the cervical canal and the vagina form the birth canal. The wall of the uterus is composed of three layers of tissue. The outermost layer, a thin, membranous, and serous layer, is called the parametrium. The middle layer, known as the myometrium, is a thick, muscular layer. During childbirth, the myometrium generates strong contractions to expel the fetus from the uterus. Beneath this and inside the uterus lies the endometrium, a glandular inner layer. During the menstrual cycle, the endometrium undergoes cyclic changes, preparing for potential implantation of a fertilized egg. We will discuss these changes in greater detail in another video. All the organs we have discussed so far, along with the uterus, are classified as female secondary sex organs. These organs play a vital role in supporting reproduction, each contributing in some way to the process of reproduction and childbirth. However, the primary female sex organ, which is responsible for producing the female gamete or ovum, are the ovaries. Let us now discuss about the structure of ovary in detail. There are two ovaries, one on each side of the lower abdomen. Each ovary is an elliptical or oval-shaped structure, measuring approximately 2 to 4 centimeters in length. Each ovary is surrounded by a thin layer of germinal epithelium, which is composed of cuboidal epithelial cells. These cells are continuous with the peritoneum, the serous membrane lining the abdominal cavity. Beneath the germinal epithelium lies a layer of dense connective tissue called the tunica albiginia. This tunica albiginia encloses and supports the ovarian stroma. This stroma consists of two regions, the outer cortex and the inner medulla. The ovarian follicles and the cortex are found at various stages of development, making the cortex appear dense and granular in structure. The medulla region is made up of loose connective tissue containing an abundant blood supply, lymphatic vessels, and nerve fibers. The ovary is connected to the pelvic wall and the uterus by a fibrous tissue called the mesovarium. Above the ovaries, on the left and right sides of the uterus, there is one fallopian tube on each side. These fallopian tubes are also known by various names, such as uterine tubes and oviducts. The fallopian tubes are considered a secondary female sex organ like the uterus and vagina as they transport the ovum released by the ovaries. The two fallopian tubes extend from the periphery of the ovary to the uterus. At the anterior end of the fallopian tube, there is a funnel-shaped structure called the infundibulum. Along the edges of the infundibulum are finger-like projections known as fimbriae, which help draw the ovum released during ovulation towards the fallopian tube. The opening of the infundibulum expands into a broader and central region called the ampulla. It is in this region that the ovum and sperm unite, leading to the process of fertilization. The final part of the fallopian tube, the isthmus, is narrow and thick-walled structure. It connects the infundibulum and ampulla to the uterus. The formation of the ovum in the ovary and the related ovulation cycle and the menstrual cycle are discussed in detail in the next video. The organs we have discussed so far directly contribute to female reproduction. However, the mammary glands, which we are about to discuss, do not directly aid in reproduction. Instead, they play a crucial role in nourishing the newborn after childbirth. Let us now discuss the mammary glands in detail. The mammary glands, found in both males and females, are modified sweat glands. They are paired structures located on the chest region, one on the right and one on the left. In males, these glands remain rudimentary and non-functional. 
while in females, they are naturally functional and developed. In females, breast development begins during puberty and progresses naturally during each menstrual cycle. The size of the breasts depends on the amount of fat deposits present in it. There is no correlation between the size of the breasts and their milk-producing capacity. Each mammary gland consists of glandular tissue surrounded by varying amounts of adipose tissue. Externally, at the center of the breast, is the nipple, surrounded by a pigmented circular area called the areola. After childbirth, this area becomes darker compared to other times. This darkened areola helps the newborn, whose vision is not fully developed, to identify the area for breastfeeding. The surface of the areola contains areolar glands, which are specialized sebaceous glands. These glands help prevent cracking of the skin on the nipple. Each mammary gland contains 2 to 25 lobes, which are separated by adipose and connective tissues. These lobes are arranged around the breast. Within each lobe are numerous smaller structures called lobules. Each lobule contains numerous acini or alveoli, which are surrounded by epithelial cells. These cells secrete milk. The milk produced in the alveoli is transported through the mammary tubules to the mammary duct. The mammary tubules from each lobule converge to form the mammary duct, which carries the milk to the lactiferous sinus, a storage area for milk. This wider region is known as the mammary ampulla. The lactiferous sinus eventually opens into the lactiferous duct. When a baby breastfeeds, the milk stored in the lactiferous sinus is released and flows through each lactiferous duct and exits individually through tiny openings on the surface of the nipple. That concludes this video on the female reproductive system, anatomy. In the next video, we will discuss in detail how the ovum is formed in the ovary, the ovulation cycle, and the menstrual cycle. You have to excel in the education.